Once again, season's greetings. It's the Football Hipsters English Breakfast Extra podcast. Crikey, that's a mouthful, isn't it? I am your host, Chris, and you join us on the, uh, the 28th of December, just after all the Boxing Day. I'm gonna, just going to call it the Boxing Day action, because although it's across three or four days, we'll just lump it all into one, because that's easier. Uh, right, I've got uh, not one, not two, but three guests this evening. We are really giving you it on a plate tonight, aren't we, listeners? Uh, first up, my regular co-host, Mr. Ross Bramble. Uh, 100% now, Ross? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say so. They maybe the occasional sniff but otherwise yes i'm very good thank you good and, and as i said to you the other day i thank you for passing it on to me oh that it's was... great I've got, I've got friends that i was talking to like last week when i was ill that were saying oh, i'll get well soon and now they've come down with one as well they've, everyone's getting a sympathy flu it's fantastic dear 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 dear, dear. You, you've started something um well let's hope maybe i can pass mine on to my other co-host uh, that's josh good evening josh stay away from me <laughs> good evening like a, guys is this like a sort of newt ripley alien queen situation like get away from her you is it one of those situations you just want Absolutely. me to stay away yeah <laughs> let me get myself in a vacuum room <laughs> vacuum room <laughs> that's a, quite an image uh right and um we're joined by a guest tonight um we've uh, we thought over the christmas period it's an ideal opportunity to get a couple of new voices in and see how it goes so um it gives me great pleasure to join or to welcome sorry a new join uh person to the podcast and this chap is called james james truscott uh, good evening james how are you yeah hi chris pleased to be on the show thanks for having me on Fortunately, I'm not the only Saints fan on the show, so strength in numbers here <laughs> after a torrid performance. Yes, yes, we will come on to that. And uh, as Danny was saying in our group uh, earlier on, he's saying it should just call it the Arsenal and Southampton podcast. But um, no, we've managed to find two Saints fans to balance two Arsenal fans, so it will work out well. Um, James, for those of our listeners who don't know you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, so... Um, I tend to have quite a strong involvement in athletics, so I do athletics commentary um, and a bit of writing in that, and also write a few articles online for football um, and tweet lots of unpopular opinions about the sport. That sounds yeah. also familiar. <laughs> sounds very <laughs> familiar to me. And um, why, why Southampton and, and what got you into football? Okay, so um, growing up in North London in my younger years, uh, I was actually more into Arsenal. But my dad's always been a Southampton fan since that was where he was from. Uh, so when they dropped down to League One, I thought, oh, OK, can support the both now. But I just found myself just watching, just following Southampton. So interest in Arsenal just wanes and yeah, never looked back since. I do tend to go to a few late in Orient games, though. So, yeah, <laughs> quite a club hopper, you could nice. say. Nice. No, I like it. We've got a different, got viewpoints from all around the leagues. That's good because uh, Josh has sort of gone Brighton slash Arsenal in a different, in the same direction, in the different ways. So uh, mm. it works out quite well. And um, myself and Danny have a soft spot for Barnet. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're all covering all grounds here. But um, you're very welcome. Thank you for, for joining us. We're going to jump straight into the, uh, the action then and go over what we've had. Um, should say off the bat to our listeners i hope you've had a, a lovely christmas and uh hopefully you're looking forward to a very pleasant new year celebration as well stay safe people uh make sure you look after yourselves but have a, a jolly good time but let's have a look at the action then we um, we started the boxing day games uh premier league wise of course with uh, the first game of the new crystal palace era uh, the sam allardyce era Ross, what did you make of, uh, I know you didn't sort of see the game live, but Watford getting a 1-1 draw with Palace. Um, Sam Allardyce having a bit of a conflab with uh, with a mascot after the game. That was interesting. Um, but do you think he'd be pleased to get away from Vicarage Road with a point or will he see it as a missed opportunity? I think he said in the post-match that he saw it as two points dropped. But I've, I've always been of the opinion that when you're a new manager coming in midway into a season... Um, your first game should just be about making sure you don't lose because the last thing you want is to start snowballing. And I think we've seen that with the managers, um, even with a guy like Bob Bradley, who I'm sure we'll get onto later. Um, 
have a bad start and suddenly it all turns sour. So for me, I think it's a very, very good point. Um, you come in, you have to implement ideas quickly and try and sort things out and put your stamp on it. Um, you're never always going to wander into a game like that and, and come away with three points. So I thought it was a very good point, but um, I think Sam's point mainly was that on the balance of play and some of the decisions that were made, um, the Palace probably deserved more from it. But when you have um, Christian Benteke on your penalties, you don't really deserve to win 2-1. Uh, to win two one. No, odd penalty that is. He does the same thing every time, but um, it didn't really work on this occasion. Um, but uh, James, you haven't um, had your so myself and, and Ross and Josh have uh, have long been um, anti Pardew mm. people. I think it's fair to say. Um, yeah. What did What did you make of his sacking? Do you think ultimately it was was fair for Palace to have a, a better opportunity of staying up? I think it definitely was fair, particularly. Yeah. Um, Alan Pardew has a good relationship with the chairman there, Steve Parrish, and I think that I'm I'm getting quite fed up, to be honest, of these you know this constant managerial many merry-go-round in the Premier League of constantly failing managers. Pardew at every club he's um, been sacked from in the Premier League in in recent years, in particular, it's safe to say that he hasn't left he hasn't left the fans wanting more. In in effect, that he's I think they've all been deserved sackings. He's been given time. He's been given time at Palace, and I think it's definitely time for some fresh faces um so definitely deserve sacking especially when you have the worst record in the country in 2016 it's it goes it goes without saying really but i definitely think that sam allardyce in terms of an instant impact he can bring that to the team he can help them solidify i think definitely there is a possibility of them staying up considering um sam Sam allardyce done with uh sunderland prior to this one but i'm just not sure about him doing good by them in the long term yeah, I think that's fair comments. I think it's it's one of those clubs, isn't it, that the fans are fantastic down there, but um, that they've had a few managers that have been a little bit questionable, and it's whether they can sort of trans transfer that atmosphere into into winning ways. And um, similar story at Watford, really, Josh. The the Troy Deeney saga finally over. Uh, he got the the penalty that got the equaliser after Johan Kabai uh, or Kebab to joke in here, um, got the opener for Palace and, and Troy Deeney converting the penalty to uh, to make it one one. Um, What's your thoughts on on Watford and and on Deeney? Because one thing I really like about Troy Deeney is he's very very honest. After the game, he was very sort of frank in his views about being relieved to get the hundredth goal, and he managed his right to drop him, etc. It's quite refreshing in the modern day, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say he's probably one of the best level-headed captains in the Premier League at the moment. Uh, the only thing that worries me about Watford is their general lack of. Um, style of play there's not really a uh, mentality of how they want the team to go out it's just a lot of players there it's only really Deeney that kind of knows what he wants to do when the team get the ball uh, the rest of them are going around a little bit headless chickens yeah I think that's a that's a fair point do you see them finishing would you say mid-table a successful season for, for Walter Matsari if, if that's where they end up yeah, I think with the amount of changes they've had, um, mid-table mediocrity would be a, a good consolidating season for Watford. Wasn't enough for Kiko, though, was it? No, that's... I was, do you know what? You read my mind there, Ross. I was just going to say that didn't solve mm. or save Kiko uh, Sanchez Flores a job. So, well, it, put it this way, if we all... if we all, it, Let's say Watford finished 10th. Uh, do we think he stays in a job? Let's just get a yes or no. James, do you think he stays in a job? Uh, yes. Okay, Ross. I, I think they'll settle for that this season. Yeah, I think I would as well if I was a Watford fan. Uh, Ross, yes or no? Uh, should he stay in the job? Yes. Will he? I have no idea. Oh, doubt. I like it. Uh, Josh? For the teams that are above them at the moment, probably see them a couple of places higher, but just outside the Europa League places. Hmm. Interesting. I uh, yeah, I'd, I'd stick with him. I think he's done a pretty good job, especially seen as I was fully aware how his inter reign ended uh, not well. So uh, I think this is deemed a success, given how that that uh, ended up. But still, that's enough Italian because John will get excited. Um, <laughs> so that was the uh, the first game of the the Boxing Day weekend, then um, all the, the the Boxing Day games, and then we went on to the three o'clock kickoffs. There's a couple that we're going to skip through fairly quickly. Um, first one we're going to skip. Swip- skip through, put my teeth in, um, is the Arsenal game because not very much happened. Um, well, who should I pick on? Josh, I'm going to pick on you just for this this game. Um, 
a one nil victory in the end. Ben Foster uh, pulling off his very best Fraser Forster impression of uh, Saints yesteryear with coming to the Emirates and pulling off a string of fantastic saves. But eventually it was a man who'd been criticised quite heavily throughout the game, Olivier Giroud, who uh, popped up with, I think it's his 22nd headed goal since joining the club, which is a Premier League high. Um, good result for Arsenal, even if the performance wasn't exactly all that. I think any victory is a good result, uh, especially across the Boxing Day period where you get the games in thick and fast. I think Arsenal have got three games in nine days, maybe ten days. Um, these fixtures are all over the place. Um, this Christmas with Chelsea having a nice staggered gap and other teams like Arsenal and Liverpool getting them all bunched up together. It's all a bit manic, isn't it, this time of year? It's hard to keep track of... uh, It's hard for us to know when to put a podcast together, let alone to know what games are coming up. But as you say, nevertheless, a a good good victory for Arsenal. Um, To be honest, there isn't a lot more to say about that game. So we'll uh, we'll just move on to the other teams in and around the top of the, uh, the league. Uh, James, what did you make of Chelsea's performance? They uh, they got a win over Bournemouth by three goals to nil. They didn't have Diego Costa, they didn't have Angolo Conte. Uh, they didn't play Michi Batshuayi, which surprised me slightly, but instead they went with Pedro and Azar as the main sort of focal points of the forward line. Both scored, and a late Steve Cook own goal made it 3 0. Um, 12 straight wins. Can you um, Are you impressed by them, and can you see anyone stopping them at the moment? Tim, Honest with you, I'm really, really surprised by Chelsea this season. Um, knowing that Conte prefers to play free at the back, I thought Chelsea didn't have the uh, defensive strength, didn't have the strength and depth defensively to do so. But they've really shocked me because it's ever since they changed to this free at the back that they've actually hit a run of form and they've hit this um, 12, um, 12 games of winning. But people talk about Conte's teams being, um, Conte's Chelsea being pragmatic. But really what, what impressed me in Chelsea year again against Bournemouth was that they were really enjoyable to watch and they were playing some really attractive football. Uh, so that's, that, that is another thing that surprised me. And I think that Pedro has been having a good season as well. So it's good that um, Conte is getting the best out of Pedro and Hazard. I think it's kind of it's, it's a weird one because, as you say, like there was two different camps pre-season. There was the uh, the camp I must confess I was in where I I think Ross was the same where I actually thought Chelsea were favourites just because I'd seen what what Conte had done. And then there was the other camp that sort of said, well, yeah, but is he going to take a bit of time to to get used to the game? And weirdly, it was after that Arsenal game where they got really taken apart. He's changed for this back three. I think the only mm. thing that can really stop Chelsea right now is if a team works out this formation um, because I do wonder if they've got another way of playing um, and I'm not sure they have. Maybe it's more hope than expectation, but uh, yeah, let's uh, let's see how they progress. Um, what did you make of Bournemouth, Ross? Because they've had a... They've had a sort of an up and down stage, haven't they? That's some really good results. Um, obviously, losing to your boys, which you'll have uh, enjoyed greatly recently. But they've um, they had that amazing performance against Liverpool. Where where do you think they should be? I mean, Eddie Howe's done a fantastic job there. Surely they're just performing where they should be performing at this stage. Yeah, I'd probably argue that. Um, I know that when the quote unquote South Coast derby came around, um, <laughs> the feeling amongst the Bournemouth fans was that they were on our level. You know, it was finally a level playing field. Bournemouth were doing just as well as Southampton. But I always see, and I still believe, that Bournemouth are still a tier below us. I still see them as a, as a lower mid-table Premier League side, whereas I think we're an upper mid-table Premier League side. Um, they can turn in brilliant performances because they've got a fantastic team spirit and their ground is um, a fantastic stadium to turn in those kind of performances. But sometimes they just lose... Um, a lack of cutting edge or a lack of control in a game and suddenly they get tonked 3-1 by Southampton and they were not in that game at all. Um, not long after Bertrand scored the equaliser, they just fell apart in that game. Um, you think of when Burnley beat them as well, they, they never really um, showed me enough to say that they were actually going to pull a point back in that. Um, so yeah, they, they, they do have a bit of a quote-unquote softer underbelly for me but I think that's just kind of the players they've got and, and who they are. Because you, you look at that team, and most of it is still the team that came up from the championship. You know, It's, it's a very good team, but um, I still think it's punching above its weight in the Premier League. And I, I, I am a big fan of Bournemouth. I do have a soft spot in my heart for them. But um, yeah, I, I, just, I just think they've still got a bit of a way to go if they want to start um, moving up mm. into, the, into the top 10 and staying there. Yeah, I completely agree with you there, Ross. Like, as, as you were talking, I was just nodding my head in, in agreement throughout. I, I think they definitely are a team that Eddie Howe has built to be greater than the sum of their parts. 
um, and they are punching above their weight and overachieving. And I, I like to see them doing so, but I just find them a bit disorganized, um, a bit erratic. You don't know what to expect from them. They they might get goals, but I feel they they have a tendency to concede a lot. You, they don't they don't really inspire confidence. They really um, the money they spent in the summer could have been better spent on perhaps a marquee player to offer them some cutting edge. I realise that the signings they got in terms of uh, Jordan uh, Jordan Ibe and Brad Smith were perhaps trying to align with their philosophy of having young players, young homegrown players. But I do think they need something different. I think Wilshire has definitely bought them that. You know, but I, I, again, he's he's not been consistent enough because he's still working his way back from fitness, isn't he? And it's a new system for him. Um, difficult to to suddenly be playing week in week out. I th- I, think, I still think there's signs for them there. I mean, Benekafobe has not been brilliant since they made, they spent all that money on him. But uh, I, I tip them to go down at the start of the season because of results like these and performances like these because they just kind of happened too often. And I didn't I didn't think they'd replaced well enough at the time. But uh, I think I think Wilshire has papered over some of those cracks. But they they definitely do have some some problems there. They yeah. certainly remind me of uh, Swansea when they first came up. Yeah, I agree similar, with that. similar kind of play, and they just need someone to take them up to that upper echelon, push them on to the next level. Are you saying they need a Michu? Oh, Michu. Remember him. <laughs> That's that. I, I, do you know what? I love sometimes, occasionally, I just love like picking out players from the past, and people go, Oh, do you remember so and so? And loads of people go, Oh yeah, I do remember. And then you really have to dig out where they are. Does anyone actually know where where Mitra is? By the way, at the moment, last time I heard, I, he was at some third tier Spanish side, wasn't he? I thought it was further down, and it was his brother's team, and he was doing that to get back up to fitness. I think he he's was. playing higher up the divisions now. Mm. Yeah, he he's actually currently at Real Oviedo in Spain, which I think are second Se- tier. Segunda. Segunda. Okay. Yeah, I think they are. Um, he's uh, he's notched a, a whopping one goal in fourteen games. So wow. um, he it just goes to show some players have that one season and then disappear. Maybe he could be Swansea manager. Maybe that's the the trick we're missing. We'll uh, we'll come on to Swansea in a minute, but uh, nevertheless, um, let's uh, move on to another team. Uh, that we're we're challenging, as I say, we're looking at the sort of the teams at the top end of the league to start with, um, and we we have to put uh, we have to put Manchester United into that bracket because they are creeping slowly upwards. A three-one victory over Sunderland. Um, Josh, what did you what do you make of this turnaround under Mourinho? Because it's clear, and we'll talk about that goal in a minute. That Henrik Mkhitaryan is offside, has made a big offside. difference, <laughs> indeed. Um, but. I'm going to bang my own drum here and say that all those people that said Zlatan was finished, don't you look silly now? Because, OK, he's not going to run in behind. He's never going to have pace. But at 35 years of age, uh, 17 goals for Manchester United already. I just think his his leadership, his example um, of how you know how to to uh, to improve a side has dragged United through this bad spell. And now they're coming out smelling of roses. Would you agree? Yeah, have you got any Holiday sauce for this egg on my face uh, for saying exactly <laughs> that? Did you say it? I, I genuinely didn't know you said that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't think bus. he'd uh, notch more than 10 this season. Um, however, yeah, I've I've been taking more of a step back objective view from Man United, putting aside all previous uh, thoughts and dislikes over certain players and the club itself. And Mourinho is doing a very interesting job there. Um, he's not doing better than Van Gaal, not doing better than Moyes. He's just doing something different, and it seems a very difficult club to manage. So I'm not sure whether or not he's lost his sheen as a man or as a manager, um, but there's definitely something going on there that I think we just need to have a step back and see that maybe forces above him uh, causing the issues for that team, and it's not the manager but on the on the goal, it's like every other famous scorpion kick I've seen. It's all come from an offside. <laughs> I did see there's quite a few people, weren't there? Like I think Ian Wright said a match today last night. If there's one goal you'd like to see allowed, even though it's offside, it's that one. It's offside. Um, I, I don't, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not one of these people that salivate over a goal and then just ignore the rules. You know, I, I can't get over the fact that it was offside <laughs> and quite clearly offside as well. Some of the best and most famous goals that have ever been scored have been offside or have been handballs, and people just kind of go, "Oh yeah, but no, it was offside. Let's stop going mad over it. It was offside." 
Ross, Ross Bramble killing dreams since 2016. <laughs> but I'm you're sorry, right. it was offside. I mean, if, 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 that had been, right. if that had been a Only one nil recently. win, if, if that had been a one nil win and Mkhitaryan had scored that, I, I yeah. would love to have seen the reaction because it was three one and it was Sunderland. Oh yeah, what a lovely goal! We should stand because you know it was such a no. Piss off! It was offside. <laughs> Okay, so so we 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 all agree it's offside. There's no d- disputing it. I've got two Southampton fans on this podcast tonight. Um, you would both, even if you hadn't seen him in the flesh, you would both be fully aware of some of the goals that a certain Matt Letizia used to score uh, for your wonderful club. So you'd be well versed to talk about this. So I'll give you both an opportunity just to talk about the technique or uh, you know the class of the goal. Um, Ross, obviously, as I say, taking away the fact is offside. The, the technique to be able to do that um do you obviously it's not a fluke he obviously meant to do it but do you think it's one in a million or do you think that's the sort of thing that he would do time and again i think it's the kind of thing you try in training um and then sometimes they go in and then they do the rounds on the social media and everyone goes oh wow but you never really get the opportunity rather than um the, the actual technique I, I think it's the opportunity that is normally lacking in actual games um it is a one in a million. It is a fantastic goal. It's not something that he'll probably produce again during his career. Um, but I, I still not of the opinion that it should have stood. So I can't go any further than that because it was offside. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and James, have you seen one seen one better? Can you, can you think of a goal that you've seen either in the flesh or either on the in the flesh? Sorry, or on TV? Anything that you can pinpoint as being better than that? Uh, definitely not in. Um... In recent times or in the Premier League this season, because I think any goal that isn't conventional in technique is perhaps more elevated, perhaps better than uh, a simple, well, I say simple, but a, a long distance strike, a long range strike or something along those lines, because it's just something that, as Ross right, rightly said, that players just don't have the audacity to try. I think that shows... I think that signals a great player when they have the audacity, uh, the kind of confidence in their own ability to try these sort of things. Because I think perhaps giving it a try, more a fair few players would be able to do this type of thing on the training field. But it it needs something, it requires something else, something special to do it in the match. Um, and I think perhaps Latan's been teaching him a thing or two on the training field. Yeah, I'm glad somebody said that because it, it was almost like it should have been the other way around because um, that I've seen Zlatan score a number of goals like that. One that really comes to mind is it was against Bastia, uh, I think it was last season, where he almost hooks it from behind his head and it, it is is literally like some kind of martial arts move. Um, and technically, and I know a lot of English fans have got on Zlatan's back about this, it's technically a high foot, but I think you want, in that sort of circumstance, you want the decision to be given, um, although maybe not in an offside position. Yeah, um, well you... M- Sorry. Go on, no, go on. You mentioned um, uh, that it was similar to a martial arts move, and I think if I'm not uh, if I'm not incorrect here, that, that Zlatan does do taekwondo or some form of martial arts. He does, yes, and absolutely I think, right. I think that could be key um, to him playing into his mid thirties to such a high standard. Because I heard lots of talk um, Ryan Giggs in latter stage of his his career, him doing yoga. Um, yeah. So I think so. I think that players who are intent, who are keen to put in the extra hours beyond the training ground to keep their body in good shape, to keep their things such as their flexibility and their range of movement, things that wane in latter stages of their career. They're the ones that are able to play longer. Um, and I think Zlatan, the fact that he's never relied on pace for his whole career, he's never really had much pace. Um, I think that's a contributing factor as well to why he's been able to play so long because he's so used to playing without it that he knows how to adapt. But I, th- I really think that um, the kind of snobbery that uh, Premier League fans have towards other leagues in their uh, belief, constant belief that the Premier League is far, far better than any other league has you know, perhaps led to Zlatan kind of being disregarded. It's not, um, not as good as some of the strikers he had in the Premier League, but I'm pleased to see, even as a Saints fan and not a Manchester United fan, I'm pleased to see that he is proving the critics wrong because when you have players like, like Zlatan Ibrahimovic firing and doing well i think they're enjoyable for a fan of any club to watch 
Agreed, agreed. And don't get me started on people slagging off the French League. I'll be here all bloody night, uh, <laughs> defend it every week on the uh, on the podcast. But you're right. I mean, I think, you know, for every um, Matthias Kesman coming from Holland, there is a Zlatan that comes from France. And sometimes players can just take the, themselves to another level and, and, and achieve. Others, not so much. So I agree. I think there is a snobbery in, in the UK uh, for certain players of certain nationalities or from other leagues. So, um Totally agree with you there. Very good points made by all. Um, just quickly on Sunderland as well. Uh, just this wasn't a game they would have expected to take anything from, would, would you say? No, it's certainly not a game that David Moyes has looked there and said, yeah, easy three points. He's gone there, thought, what can we get out of this? A bit like um, the game we previously talked about, the West Brom uh, Arsenal game. It's it's a game that you earmark to try and get a draw from. And yeah, that's where you leave it. Yeah, game, set and match. The Sunderland uh, remains struggling, but they will look for other days uh, ahead, certainly uh, the next trip to Burnley, which we'll touch on later on. But uh, the other club, of course, are in the in the mix. Well, the other two clubs, I should say, but the other club that played on the Boxing Day were Man City, who got a 3-0 victory over Hull City. Uh, Ross, impressed by uh, Guardiola's seeming sort of flexibility all of a sudden he seems to have changed to more of a 4-1-4-1 um he's he's sort of covered the loss of Aguero by moving De Bruyne sort of further forward um playing with almost a false nine at times seems to have uh, seems to have worked but is it more about how poor Hull are as a side or about how ruthless Man City were on the night um I think it's a bit of both because I think this Hull side is is arguably one of the worst Premier League sides we've seen in a long time um, and that's saying something, considering we were saying about six months ago that Newcastle were one of the worst Premier League sides we'd ever seen. Um, but Hull, Hull just go limp. They just look so dead at times. It's, it's difficult to actually classify them as a football team sometimes because you just don't understand what they're trying to do. You don't understand why they're even there on occasions. Um, and I, I still think they've been worse um, so far this season, but they didn't help themselves against Man City. The thing I'd say about Man City, though, is that... It's, um, Oddly, just after I criticised, well, not criticised, but, you know, brought up some points about Pep Guardiola, they seem to have figured things out, turned things around, um, kept a few more clean sheets, kept a few more goals out. Um, I think they were a little lucky with the Watford game last week. Um, they, if, if that game had ended 2-2, I don't think too many people would have been too shocked about it, but they got the three points there. Um, and they just seem to have taken confidence from it. You know, they've, they've made a couple of tweaks. It seems to be suiting the players a bit more, and he's changed things around, and it, it's starting to look a bit better. So um, I'm happy for Pep. You know, I've, I've always said that he's a very good manager, someone I want to see do well, even if I don't enjoy his style. Um, and he seems to have tweaked it enough to, to paper over some cracks at the very least. Um, he also said this week that he's not going to come in for a bid for Virgil van Dijk, so definitely in my good books. So, yeah, I, I was impressed, but at the same time, you know, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt because Hull are a, a very poor side at the moment, and I think uh, I think better teams will put far more past them. Agreed. And you and I both know managers saying they won't do something. Surely they wouldn't go and do that one thing, would they? Yeah, I think they probably will. Um, but I, I hope Van Dijk stays for another season or till the end of the season at least. But yeah, maybe we'll, we'll touch on, on him in a moment. But um, yeah, good result for City who, who got back up uh, to where they wanted to be in the league table by uh, leapfrogging at the time Liverpool, who then went on to play last night at the time of recording, Tuesday night, got a 4-1 victory over Stoke. James, were you were you impressed with Liverpool because they they started quite slowly and Stoke were obviously a goal up. Jonathan Walt was, um, I think, Simon Mignolet has got a few questions to ask there as well uh, of himself. But they started well and they really should have or could have been two up. And it does make you wonder: had they have gone two up, would Liverpool have had the powers of recovery to to get a four-one win in the end? What did you make of them? I definitely think that um, even if Stoke had gone two 0 up, Liverpool they. They have the requisite firepower to bounce back. Um, they're a really exciting team to watch, a good attacking team. But I think the question mark that remains over everyone's heads is how vulnerable they are defensively. It seems that regardless of the combination they play at the back, um, they seem to be vulnerable in defence. The past couple games with Mignolet and Goal, they've, they have looked a bit better. But I don't know whether that's a kind of change in attitude a change in a mindset since um, Karras has been dropped. I mean, Matip has looked reasonably good, but it's just a question of um, who to partner him with, really. But yeah, I definitely think Liverpool would have been capable of bouncing back. Yeah, I do agree that, that as you say, it's, it's that, that kind of you score three, we'll score four mentality. Um, 
Josh, do you do you think that could get them through through to a title challenge? I mean, I, I'm I'll be honest, I'm a little bit sniffy about about Liverpool. You know, I I don't dislike Klopp. I I like him as a bloke. Well, I don't know him personally, but I'm sure he's lovely. Um, you know, I like the passion and energy, but I'm not personally convinced that just giving a player a hug and being friendly with the media is, is enough to justify the fact that your team cannot defend for Toffee. Um, he had the same problem at Dortmund and ultimately it ended it ended you know badly um, and, and he left Dortmund in a bit of a mess really and I'm, I'm just not convinced. Uh, yeah you could do it against Stoke but they've got real tests coming up in the next few few games so what do you make of them? Where do you stand on, on, on this situation with them? Yeah, it's one of those that I don't think uh, Klopp's going to be too worried about them conceding goals until these these scoreline slots start getting a little bit closer. That you know, if they're just scraping two one wins here, there, you know, three two wins, it's it's very strange this Liverpool team at the moment. I I still don't think they've got what it takes to win the league, but I do expect them to be knocking around the top four. Um, but I. I can also see this team just burning out come March because they are playing incredibly high intensity football. And I just don't think they've got that stamina just to keep up with it, just to mirror exactly what happened at Dortmund with Klopp previously burning out a team. I think this could happen to this Liverpool side. And as you say, they can't defend. And one of the saving graces they have got is that Matip has got a bit of a... um, it's had a falling out with the Cameroonian FA, so it isn't going to the African Cup of Nations. So at least he's going to be sticking around through January. Yeah, yeah, and I think because Mane goes, doesn't he? I think that's the only one they're going to they're going to lose at that stage, though. But um, yeah, I I do agree with the burnout thing. It's the Bielsa effect, as I like to call it. I just wonder if they can sustain it the whole way. And don't forget, we've got to factor in the FA Cup still, uh, which in the League Cup. They got a and double the leg cup. against Southampton in the league. That's cup, yeah. a very good point. I completely forgot about that, which I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, but yeah, of course they're not in Europe, which is is a bonus. But um, yeah, it does make you wonder. It does make you wonder. But nevertheless, a uh, a victory for Liverpool as well. So um, all of the top clubs winning. Um, we will come on to tonight's game to sum up the, the top clubs. In fact, should we do that now. Let's get it out of the way because we're going to go down to bottom otherwise. So let's touch on tonight's Wait, game. Hang on, um, are we referring to Spurs as a top club? Controversial. Uh, ooh, don't ask me that question because I, I can't be I can't be biased on this podcast. They're a top I club. There, I've said it for you. Yeah. Okay. Fine. They are. Um, however, however, um, I'm a little bit angry about tonight's result. Not just because I'm, I'm an Arsenal fan, but a little bit angry about the decision making. Um, let's get straight to it. Ross, for you, obviously a great start, Virgil van Dijk's header, and always looking swimmingly uh, good for the for the home side. And and then obviously Spurs got level with with Deli Ali's header, a little bit of a switch off after a deflected cross. Um, and then there was this this incident um, where Mike Dean, uh, Jasper Carrot, as I like to refer to him as. Um, sent off Nathan Revan. We should say at this point, of course, Spurs were 2-1 up. I have to say that Harry Kane and put them in front. But that that goal, or sorry, that red card for me killed the game off. Um, what did you what did you make of it? What, which side of the fence do you fall on? Um, well, to start with, I think the first two goals actually killed the game off. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought we were well in control of it and I thought we had a good tempo, um, a good pace, um, good structure. I thought we were well in control of the game. Then a deflected cross finds Deli Alley. the goal goes in and from then on I think Tottenham kind of grow into it and we, and we just lose control um, the second one really rocks us as well just after half time um, obviously then we get the penalty decision um, if he pulled it back and given a free kick I wouldn't have been too bothered even if he booked him I would have thought he would have been harsh but I, I wouldn't have been too bothered because um, he's, he's definitely pulled Deli Alley back on the way to the penalty area but the decision that he's given is, is advantage. He's given the advantage so that Dele Alli can continue his run, which is the correct decision. Um, Dele Alli takes the advantage, takes his shot, misses it by quite a distance. Um, and then while, while he's in the area, Nathan Redmond has um, reached out to try and get him, or try and get a hand on him, try to push him, try to hold him, whatever he's trying to do. He's put a hand out, he's kind of brushed him down the arm. Uh, Nathan Redmond has fallen under the pace of his, of, of his run. Um, and Deli Ali has thrown himself to the floor because he's felt a touch. Um, for me, the advantage was given. Uh, Ali took the advantage, took the shot, and missed it. So it should have been done there. Um, if you're going to pull it back, I would have said it was a free kick because that's where the damage was actually done. That's where the actual infraction was. The penalty, I think, is extremely harsh. I think Deli Ali has has bought it. Um, 
to then take 40 seconds to have a chat with Nathan Redmond and then decide that it was bad enough for a sending off, I think is an absolute aberration. Because it, it can't be because he was the last man, because there was two players alongside him while he was running back catching, um, catching Deli Alley. It can't be because of a dangerous tackle, because it's not a dangerous tackle. He's, he's slipped over, so, you know, maybe he's seen something that has looked dangerous, but it's just a slip. He hasn't really done any damage to him. He's just run his arm down the side of him. Um, so I, I don't know where any of it comes from. Like I say, I, I could see if it was a free kick for, for the pullback on the way into the area, but after that, I don't understand a single word of it. The only justice was that Harry Kane put it as high as I've ever seen anyone put a penalty. Yes, it was certainly a high penalty after the ball seemed to Yuri Geller across the uh, penalty spot briefly. Uh, for those of you who don't know that reference, look up Euro 96. Um, James, what was your take on it? Also, as a Saints fan, what, what was your views? Yeah, I don't want to sound biased, but I think that's a pretty fair assessment from uh, Ross there um, in regards to the penalty incident. Um, I think any the, the, the little contact that did take place took place outside of the penalty area, Um and, and Deli Ali, after missing the shot, then decided he would go down. I could understand if perhaps the free kick or a yellow card even was given to Redmond. But I think it's a bit sketchy that Mike Dean took so long to make the decision. And I really think that did kill off the game. Because um, Southampton, you could argue, were perhaps um, seeing more of the ball, creating more chances in the first half to begin with. When, when the equaliser came in, um, I think Spurs regained their momentum uh, definitely through the second goal in the, um, at the near the beginning of the second half. They did so again, but I don't think Southampton were down and out until Redmond um, got a red card. He's got a lot of stick from Southampton fans recently, but I think in terms of creating opportunities um, and kind of aggravating the opposition defence, he's still been doing quite well, even though goals have been absent from his game. And I think he was having quite a good game, particularly in the first 20 minutes of the match today. It's uh, it was definitely one that divided opinion. Josh, did you have an opinion on it as well? Be rude to leave you out. Did you, what did you think of the whole, the game itself and that decision in, in, in its, uh, in its decision-making, shall we say with Mike Dean? Cause again, I was angry about it. I, I wasn't very happy with the decision. Um, Again, I'm trying to put all bias aside for this one. Um, Mike, Mike Dean did go kind of full celebrity ref on that one, um, especially with how he gave the penalty. And I think the whole thing about Mike Dean, it's been said before, he seems the kind of guy that makes the game about him, which isn't what a ref should be doing. Um, they're meant to go under the radar and uh, happily get that, you know, get the job done efficiently and effectively and I don't think he did that um as, as has been previously said the the game was killed by the penalty they could get back into it potentially in Southampton um but yeah I think overall I think we just got to have a look at that offense um it's been said that uh, I think the BBC have got it up that under new rules had Redmond tried to win the ball through a tackle he would have received just a caution but because it's a pull shows no intent to get the ball so it's a uh, red card under the new rules which seems very vague but so do most rules in football at the moment mm. yeah I agreed I, I yeah I just uh, I'm just annoyed uh, I just didn't think it was I, I I'm Again, trying not to be biased here, but I think Deli Ali has um, a very annoying habit of going down very, very easily at the moment, and it's um, is starting to slightly frustrate me. I think it's fair to say, and uh, and I think the referee bought it um, massively, and I just, I, I just think it's a very, very strange decision to make. Um, and and he and he, he has that look, doesn't he, Mike D? When he makes a decision, it's like, oh, as you say, look at me, just grr, don't like it. Don't like it, but nevertheless, we'll um, leave that one there for now, and uh, we'll, we'll move on to our other games. Um, I want to talk a little Chris, bit about the. Chris, I wanted to ask James a question. Oh, go for it, Ross. Feel free. Uh, it seems silly to us for us to have another Southampton fan on the podcast and not ask about Claude Puel. Um, clearly, yes. quite divisive among the Southampton fans. Um, a year ago, in the same <clears throat> same time this year, uh, we were a point worse off under Kuman than we were under Claude Puel. But um, I think the Salanta fans kind of feel, generally speaking, that the performances haven't been good enough. Uh, so I was going to ask James' opinions on Puel. Do you think the system has worked? Do you think he's been justified in that? Um, do you think he's worth keeping on past this season? 
Uh, good question. I don't think he's immune from criticism, obviously, but I think the fans have been way, way too harsh. I think the kind of success and continued improvement that Southampton have been experiencing over the years have kind of led to um, the expectations of the supporters not really being managed as well as um, they should be. If you look at the table, um, going into this game with Spurs, we are seventh or eighth place, seventh place, I think, um, by Manchester United. Every single one of the clubs ahead of us, I would consider to be bigger clubs than us, uh, big clubs than the Saints in terms of st- in terms of stature. Teams like Arsenal, Spurs, Manchester United, Liverpool, Chelsea, um, the teams are, the teams ahead of us, um, and I don't really see um, any any problem with that I think it's clear where we need to strengthen in terms of attack we've been lacking goals but the fault with that doesn't doesn't lie with Claude Puel he got a lot of stick at the beginning um for playing the uh 4-4-2 uh diamond system but I felt that a lot of people were simply attacking the system because the results weren't good rather than the fact that the the system didn't work um I think the uh a problem we have had is that although Charlie Austin was getting goals I don't feel the way the rest of the team plays is suited to Charlie Austin's style, um, certainly in the way we've been playing. The, Charlie Austin, he's not exactly a striker blessed with pace. Um, he's, he's good in the air. He's, he's, he's a good finisher. But the pace we had um, in midfield on the wings wasn't really complementing his style because he doesn't have a tendency to hold up the ball as such. He, um, we, we were playing the ball in front of him and quite often he was unable to run onto it. And um, so he's getting a lot of goals through headers, cr- scrappy finishes, penalties. And I think we've been exposed since his injury because playing the 4-3-3 system that we've we've changed to, it's beyond me how in a 4-3-3, the, um, the central striker can be left so isolated. That's what we've seen with Rodriguez. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I think uh, Austin's a bit of a poacher rather than the target man. And we've tried to make him into a target man. And I just exactly. think that he's he's not stepped into Pella's shoes like we'd hoped he would. So... Um, I know I've been saying on the podcast for the past few weeks now, I would love to see us go back in for Sebastian Haller, who we were linked with in, in the summer. Um, it wouldn't cost a lot of money because the Eredivisie is not, uh, is not swimming in finance. So I would love to see us go back in for him. I think if we have a target man, I think we, uh, with, I think we look a different prospect because, oddly enough, whenever Van Dijk is up, we look as dangerous as we ever do. Exactly. I'm not in favour of us playing the ball in the air, but I, I think having a towering striker would do no harm because we lack height. You need, you need the, the option, fields. don't you? At the very least, exactly. the option. Exactly. But I think that a player we're more likely to go in for would be uh, Manolo Gabbiadini of um, Napoli. Ever- um, Everton have been more strongly linked to him in the English press, but um, Gianluca Di Marzio and Sky Sport Italia have been reporting that Southampton and Wolfsburg are the front runners for him. So that'd be an interesting prospect if he joins. He's not always used as an out and out striker. Um, so that could be a problem because I think we. At the moment, we have we have a lot of players who are kind of winger slash strikers. I think we need an out and out goal scorer. I'm not sure whether he gives us that, but perhaps he would favour playing there. We'll see. It's good, good chatter. I like it, I like it, and uh, our fans will uh, will enjoy a little bit of Saints talk because we we like to mix it up on on this podcast. And speaking of mixing it up, uh, let's go down the bottom end, shall we say? I could have maybe put that better. Um, just quickly, Burnley, Middlesbrough. Uh, Ross, let me ask you about this one because obviously you watched a lot of Burnley last season. Um, they got up to the Premier League this year. Everyone said their home form will be crucial. Uh, it seems to be proving that that is the case, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um... These kind of performances are why I think they'll stay up. And these are also the kind of performances why I think Middlesbrough are still in massive trouble. Um, the way the season's gone now, I think the bottom three is almost a lock with, with Sunderland, Swansea and Hull. But I still think Middlesbrough are in big, big danger. Um, and still have a lot of work to do because they just, they just don't have enough about them. I still see them majoritively as a championship team with a few mercenaries in it. So um, I'm still worried for Middlesbrough. I think this is a very concerning result for them. But for Burnley, it's it's absolutely fantastic. If they're going to go with this policy of continually losing away, then they have to make sure they balance every single loss with a win. So um, this was a big game for them, the one they absolutely had to win. And thankfully for them, they did. 
a win, as you say, is, is crucial uh, when you are well, looking at that sort of situation that they're in. Those home victories are going to be so, so important. Um, now, speaking of uh, important wins, that uh, brings us on to, I think this is the final two games. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, Leicester, Everton, Swansea, West Ham. We'll start with Leicester because I want to sort of finish on Swansea with our roundup. Um, I think, personally, they are in serious trouble. Um, I don't want to ask two of your opinions on this, because I know I've spoken to Ross about this at length. So, Josh, let's start with you. Um, do you think Leicester are in serious danger here? Because Ranieri dropped Riyad Mahrez. Um, he didn't seem to... Uh, I don't know. It, it just, to me, strikes me as a team that are really not there at the moment. Is, is that fair? Do you, do you think they are in a relegation battle now? Uh, I think I've spoken before about uh, Leicester City and what I think they'll do this season. Uh, they've got quite a nice, uh, friendly run-up um, across uh, this period, especially across January. And I think with them having a break from the Champions League will allow them to regroup and refocus on what they need to get done. Uh, I think their focus is now purely on the Premier League, making sure they get a nice string of results together Obviously, the previous uh, results they've had since that glorious win at Man uh, against Man City would kind of hold that against them. Uh, with Bournemouth, Stoke, and you know Everton results, with, which haven't been convincing, they've got West Ham and Middlesbrough in the next two games, and I'd like to see six point return from that before I start saying I think they'll go down because I still think they've got enough quality in that squad to pull clear of a relegation battle come February. Yeah, so it's, it's a tough uh, tough one, isn't it, for them? Because they, they do look, to me, like a side playing without any confidence. What do you make of the James? Because obviously, you know, we, I think we all knew there'd be a drop-off this season after what they achieved last season. I think everyone knew that. Um, but quite such an alarming drop-off. Um, OK, yeah, you've got the Champions League um, situation. Um, you know, they're doing well in that. But is this a little bit of an alarming drop-off for you, given... You know, given where they should be as as potential and defending champions. Yeah, definitely alarming. I agree with um, some of what Josh has been saying, but for me, there's three key reasons um, that I've kind of earmarked as to why Leicester are struggling this season. I think one of them is the fact that they did concede lots of goals last season. They're not really conceding that much more. There hasn't really been that much difference in terms of that. It's just that last season they were relying so much on outscoring. Um, opponents and rather than sorting out their defence in the summer they didn't really strengthen it they just added a little bit of depth um, with one with one or two signings I don't think that was sufficient uh, also what they're missing in midfield is the inter- is the interceptions number of interceptions the kind of dynamism that N'Golo um, Conte brought so I think that's something you'll definitely need to look at in um, in January Daniel Amati uh, a couple games, he's he's kind of shown that, but he's been he's been too inconsistent, and I, he hasn't really forged a partnership as such of drink water as the midfield has been changing. Um, and up front, I think what we're seeing is uh, Riyad Mahrez. His head seems to be in another place. Uh, I think he's got half an eye in a transfer, and it's been the case um, since the summer because I'm not sure how the, where the statistic stands now. But what I did notice, I think it was a a few weeks ago, before the Man City game, we had Mahrez had barely completed any passes um, to Jamie Vardy. And it's that partnership that got them so many goals last season, but he's really struggling to find him. Uh, Jamie Vardy is still making those runs. He's still making good runs, but he's not receiving the balls that he did from Mahrez um, last season. I agree that that sort of partnership has definitely uh, affected their ability to turn uh, sort of draws into into wins or performances into wins more importantly. So, yeah, I totally agree on that. They are in a little bit of a pickle. They'll definitely be needing to pick up results sooner rather than later. Although we seem to keep saying that quite a lot recently. Um, so that brings us just to Swansea. Uh, good old Swansea. Ross, um, if our listeners don't know, do you want to fill them in on what has happened and uh, who the likely candidates are to um, cover what has happened, shall we say? Yes, well, um, un- un- unsurprisingly to everyone, I think Swansea got abs- another absolute tonging on the weekend. They lost 4-1 to, to West Ham, um, which put paid to Bob Bradley. So he has now been relieved of his duties. I think it's 11 games he got 
Um, so he's now out. Um, I don't know who the favourite is, actually. I've not seen the betting odds, but I know Ryan Giggs has obviously been heavily linked. Um, I still have a sneaky suspicion it'll be Alan Pardew. Um, I think he's the only manager that will be mental enough to take the job and that uh, Swansea will be looking at as someone that can actually keep them up. Um, but yes, some interesting names will no doubt be floated. Um, Ryan Giggs is obviously the favourite for it, even though I don't think he'll touch that with a 10-foot barge pole because he seems to be waiting for a perfect managerial job, you know, like Arsenal, lose Wenger. Oh, Ryan Giggs will put in his CV there. I don't think he'll go anywhere near a club as in as much turmoil as, as Swansea are. So... Yeah, that's the situation we're in at the moment. Um, like I say, if I was a betting man, I would put money on Pardew, but uh, there are some far uh, far varying names to uh, to throw into the hat as well. Agreed, agreed. James, has he been... Bob Bradley, has he been treated fairly? Is Was he a doomed man for the minute he came in, and more importantly, for the minute he was uh, American? Because um, there seems to be... Again, I have a real issue with... A lot of what said, yes, I know they conceded a lot of goals. Yes, I know they weren't necessarily improving under him, but he had no opportunity to bring in new players. He had a very short window to repair a side that were, in my opinion, at least already heavily broken, if not damaged beyond all repair. Um, They've been a club in decline for a while. Is this a fair decision on, on Bob Bradley? It's not at all a fair decision, in my opinion. I think it's a real shame to see Swansea um, fall this way because... They were so, so well run uh, in previous years in the whole ascent into the Premier League and also the start they've made in the Premier League. But the decision to sack Gary Monk has led to a number of really ridiculous and nonsensical decisions afterwards. Guidolin did a really good job of steadying um, the ship after um, Gary Monk was sacked. But the decision to appoint him in the long run was... um, was strange, and I think that baffled a lot of people, not uh, not only in the media, not only fans, but at the club as well. Um, and then, again, I think that at the beginning of the sweet season, Swansea, they had a lot of tough fixtures, and I don't think, even though they were low down in the table, Guidolin necessarily negotiated those fixtures too badly. So I think it was harsh to sack him in the first instance. Um, and... I think what it all boils down to is their lack of investment in the summer. They have quite a poor squad um, compared to the rest of the league. Failure to replace um, Andre Ayew and uh, Ashley Williams sufficiently um, has contributed to that. I really don't know what's going on in terms of their recruitment, but um, the most recent striker signings in terms of Ed Poloshi, um, Govis, and now Borja uh, Baston, just really been all uninspiring. Um, one thing that I've read today has been noted is that apparently Swansea scouts attend a lot of their own team's games, a lot of their own team's home games, which is a bit strange. So I really don't know what's going on in terms of recruitment. But Bob Bradley, um, I agree with what you've been saying there in terms of the tide has been, it was against him from the start in terms of him being American, people already making jokes, um, mocking him. The final nail in the coffin really was when he, use terms such as road games and PK um, uh, after the loss, I think it was against Sunderland. But um, an interesting comparison, I think um, he played, uh, Bob Bradley was in charge for 11 games from which they they gained perhaps only eight points. I think Allardyce in keeping up Sunderland, um, after 11 games in charge, he had nine points and he managed to keep them up. So I think that kind of highlights the importance of that January transfer window Uh, And it's worth noting as well that Bob Bradley, um, when he took over, he was told that he would have that January transfer window to strengthen. So if you're you're giving a manager a remit for the January transfer window for the long term, you can't then judge them based on uh, short term results. But I think really they just bowed into to fan pressure, which is a shame, really, because Bob Bradley was a really exciting appointment. Um, And if he did well, I think that would have really knocked down a door in terms of Premier League managerial appointments and opened it up to to fresh faces and fresher faces. But the fact that um, his stint there will be regarded perhaps unfairly as a failure will mean that the same old guards will be getting the jobs. And unfortunately, that could signal someone like Pardew, someone like Redknapp um, getting this uh, Swansea job. But I think if he knew... If he knew beforehand that he wasn't going to get the January transfer window, then perhaps he would have came in, he would have sorted out the defence. But he's quite a strong-willed person, Bob Bradley. He's a leader. He's a real leader. And uh, that that is shown by how he reacted to the Port Said massacre 
while he was in charge of the Egypt national team. And I think that he was so keen to impose um, his own tactics, his own mentality on the team and then wait, bring in his own signings when really it should have just been a job. Get them solid. Get them, you know, just about managing. Organised, I suppose, is the word, isn't it? It's, exactly. Um, That's yeah. Word. <laughs> this doesn't happen very often, Chris, but I think I disagree with both you and James on, on the sacking of Bob Bradley. I do think you? Perfectly okay. justified. I, I really do. Because I, I don't even think it was the results. I think it was the performances. Because every week they were conceding three or four. That I think that is what put paid to him. If, if he lost those games 1-0 or 2-1, I think he'd still be there. I think it's the fact that it's three or four every single week. They lost 3-0 to Sunderland. You know, it, it, they, they're, they're shipping so many goals. I think that's what's put paid to him. And on that basis, I think it was completely justified. I would also agree, though, that if you hire someone and you say, right, we're going to invest in you and we're going to give you time and we're going to give you a window and that's what he signed up for, then absolutely he's been, done, he's, he's been hard done by. But I think yeah. on, the, on the results and the score lines, I, I, I don't, didn't see a reason for him to stay. I really didn't. I didn't think he deserved the window considering how poorly he'd done with them. So... You know, I, it doesn't happen often on this podcast, but I think uh, I think I may disagree with you on uh, on the Bob Bradley point. Nothing wrong with that. We like a bit of healthy disagreement. That's all good. Uh, Josh, you've been quiet. Do you have a, a view on this? I mean, is there? Do you sit between the two stools? Have you got a strong view on on which way you'd go? And I guess more importantly, who would you be looking to replace him with? Because that's uh, that's going to come into focus heavily now. Yeah, I thought that. He should have been given some more time. We've only got three days till we get into the January transfer window, and I'm sure he had a list the long of his arm for uh, who he'd like to bring in and sort this team out. They have got some big issues in that squad. There's still players in there that they came up with knocking around that squad in the likes of Leon Britton and Neil Taylor that they just need to have a big clear out there and sort them out, really. Uh, in terms of who I'd like to see come in, who could be intriguing, but I think Jurgen Klinsmann would be the man to come in for them if they're going to go towards that American side again, albeit him being German, with his uh, previous experience with the US national team. I think that could be an intriguing uh, appointment. It's very interesting, actually. I'm going to have to disagree with you there. I'm not a fan at all of Jurgen Klinsmann. Um, he's, I think he's really, really disliked by all Ameri- uh, of the vast majority of American football fans. Um, uh, Philip Lahm famously or infamously even um, came out, you know, against uh, Klinsmann, I think perhaps in an autobiography, you know, saying, claiming that he had no tactical knowledge whatsoever. So I really think that Klinsmann, he's, he's someone that's, going off largely off the back of a really impressive playing career rather than uh, any managerial talent. I think, um, like Ross, I think that perhaps Pardew is the one in the frame. But I would perhaps like to see them, as of course I would, being on the Football Hipster podcast, go for something slightly more left field, um, like uh, Gary Rowett or Nigel Pearson. Um, yeah, I reckon... I reckon it will be Pardew or Redknapp. I think Redknapp could tempt them, actually. He's, he's came out today saying that um, he'd like to uh, bring in Terry on loan and Lampard uh, on a free. I think that type of thing could do it for them. Uh, Redknapp has nothing to lose at the moment as, as well. I really it's, hope uh... it's Ryan Giggs. I really hope Ryan Giggs gets it. Just to see him fail? Or? I, I want to see his feet on the fire because every job that comes up, oh, Ryan Giggs would do that. Yeah, Ryan Giggs, he's, he's the next managerial bloody blah. Give him this job and I will be fascinated to see how well he does with Swansea because, uh, like yeah. I said earlier, he's, he seems to be waiting for the perfect job, one where he can't fail because he can't afford to because he's been touted as the next big manager that's going to go back and manage May United one day. He has to make sure that his career in management is spotless, so he is waiting for the perfect job. I would love to see him get the Swansea job. If he, if he does well with it, fantastic, great, give him the May United job one day. If it goes wrong, I will be even more fascinated to see the reaction he gets and where his career goes after that. So yeah. Giggs had two interviews for when they made the first appointment for Bob Bradley. What's going to have changed in those 86 exactly. days where he's suddenly now become the saviour? Because it screams of desperation if they're going in for a man like that to try and save their career. The thing is you know, that Giggs we've... apparently turned them down, didn't he? He said the, the project wasn't good enough, so he won't touch it now. I don't think there's any way he'll ever touch it. 
but I would so love to see it. I, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, I definitely agree on that point of, you know, what's changed. Um, you know, he had the interview. Like, why Why all of a sudden now? Oh, well, he, he's back in the frame. Well, he interviewed and he didn't get the job. So, or he didn't interview well, didn't impress people, apparently. So, you know, if that's the case, um, as, as you as you guys rightly say, why does that then justify him, him getting the opportunity to take the job again? I'm not, I'm not really sure, but... It's one that will run and run, definitely, and uh, we um, hopefully, well, I, I presume we'll have a fairly quick decision because I, I guess Swansea can't leave it too long uh, before making a decision on, on who they're going to bring in to uh, to manage the club. So hopefully we'll we'll have a decision on that soon and we'll be able to comment on it further. Um, but we will leave the Premier League there for now and we'll go into the Championship. Now, Ross, I'm going to... Um, going to throw it at you now i know obviously with family time and whatnot you have been a busy bee so um i i know you haven't necessarily seen all of the games um uh, but do you want to just give us a little bit of a rundown of the results and we'll try and pick our way through a couple of the highlights afterwards yeah absolutely um i'm not going to go through every single one because time is against us but some of the noticeable ones uh huddersfield town 2-1 winners of nottingham forest uh huge pressure now mounting on philip montanier i think he's really staying in that job because the owners are too busy trying to flog it rather than uh, actually properly run it so I, i'd be surprised to see him stay on if the club is get is sold on but uh, the fans are turning on him quite vigorously now. Uh, Barnsley, 2-0 win over Blackburn Rovers, which is a big three points for them. I know Barnsley are quite high flyers in the Championship this year, but uh, they still have to concern themselves with staying up primarily. And a big 2-0 uh, win over Blackburn Rovers is certainly useful for that. Uh, Preston North End, uh, they lost 4-1 to Leeds United, now ma- managed by Gary Monk, of course. Um, the most noticeable thing from that game was a red card for Jermaine Beckford, who uh, was sent off for kicking someone in the side of the head. Um, it wasn't as bad as all that. It wasn't a running soccer kick to the side of the head, or a Brand Yorton's punt kick. It was more both men going up for a header, falling, a bit of a tumble, and he's kind of kicked his leg out. I think he's aiming for another body part, but he's happened to catch him right on the side of the head. It's not it's not a pretty one to watch, but it's a straight red card offence, and he fully deserved it. Um, that off the back of, uh, of a red card for fighting with a teammate. So, uh, fantastic two-game spell there for uh, for Jermaine Beckford. Um, Reading 3-1 winners of Norwich City. Uh, I speculated that that could be his last game, uh, Alex Neal, and I still reckon it will be. I'd be very surprised if we wake up... Um, after the, the next Norwich game, and he's still there. But, um, yeah, that's a, a massive win for Reading, and it puts even more pressure on Alex Neal, especially now there's a big Gary Rowett shadow hanging over him. Um, Rotherham United, 3-2 winners over Wigan. That is a big result, because Rotherham, as we know, have been awful all year. But uh, they've started picking up a few wins lately, and Wigan were in all sorts of bother beforehand. But to lose that, I think, is a, a massive, massive alarm bell. Um, it's a game they should be getting something from at the very least the point, but to lose that 3-2 is, is an absolute hammer blow. Um, and the other big game from uh, that day's fixtures was Sheffield Wednesday beating Newcastle United. I think we'll come on to that in a minute because I know Chris managed to catch that game. Um, on Tuesday, we had Brighton Hove Albion beating Queen's Park Rangers 3-0. Fully deserved as well. Queen's Park Rangers are in absolutely no sort of form. Um, and then my current favourite club in uh, in the championship at the moment, Birmingham City, who of course sat Gary Rowett for no good reason and replaced him with uh, Gianfranco Zola for exciting, energising football, are now playing it side to side, have completely stripped away everything I loved about Birmingham City, and deservedly lost 1-0 to Derby County. And realistically, it should have been more, because they were awful. So uh, that's the that's the main headlines from the Championship. Um, Chris, like I say, I know you watched Newcastle Sheffield Wednesday. Were we impressed with Sheffield? Um, hugely. Yeah, really, really was, actually. I thought they were really, really good. Um, I know that um, it's one of those that some people sort of are a little bit unsure as to whether we should take, you know, should we take Newcastle um, for Red as winning the league? I, performances like this make me think maybe we don't, maybe we shouldn't, because Sheffield Wednesday were just really, really excellent. Closed down all over the pitch, um, won a lot of second balls, um, very, very good in possession as well. That was the thing that I really liked about it. It wasn't just, you know, defend for your lives and kick and rush. They really really deserve the victory um and I, I i really think they've got something going there um and i'm quite a big fan of carlos Cavajal. i think he's doing an excellent job at at um at Sheffield Wednesday and I think he's a, he's a coach that will be well sought after maybe back in his homeland at the end of the season as well so it'll be hard for them to keep uh, keep him in situ but yeah I was really impressed with Sheffield Wednesday actually I thought they were very very good it should also be noted they've just signed Callum McManaman on loan and the, the story is that they will be signing Jordan Rhodes from Middlesbrough because he is not getting a kick at the moment for them um, so they could be in with some real firepower in the new year yeah, that will be a firepower. And we should also talk about the firepower of Brighton because we've got uh, we got Josh here. Josh, um, 
very good performance from Brighton, as as Ross said, three 0 victory, and uh, a lovely moment from Anthony Knockhart as well. Um, if anyone hasn't seen this, do you want to just let people know what happened? Yeah, so this was for the third goal of the game. Uh, Anthony Knockhart back in front of his home fans uh, s- scored a goal and ran over to the dugout where he then brought out a picture of his uh, unfortunately late father who passed away about a month ago now uh, held up to the to the sky gave it a kiss and it was a really fitting moment it's the first goal he scored at the Amex since the uh, bereavement and it was just a really fitting tribute I know there was a lot of stick he was given from people that call themselves humans um i'm not sure we'll put it at that um yeah it's just a really odd atmosphere that came back from that and anybody throwing any stick at anthony knockhart he's stringing up because it was absolutely disgraceful and what he did was a incredibly touching moment i know um he especially felt a lot of love from you chris yes i uh, yeah. well i mean to be honest all i did was was show um show a few uh, or show the video um of of the goal celebration basically um which was recorded off of sky um he as as you say ran over to 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 grab the picture of his father and held it aloft um it, i just thought it was really touching and I, I very quickly recorded it and and put it on the internet and um people seem to have really taken it to the heart of course you get the odd tweet from people that say oh that's just cringe and or oh, can you not just keep it at home or something to do with football blah 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 but on the whole um fans and this is what's really interesting to me obviously a lot of people that follow me on and twitter are following me for for arsenal related things because that's what i generally talk about um i had a lot of love from I say me, or the tweet has had a lot of love from from fans of all clubs, of all shapes and sizes, even Spurs fans. You know, it's been genuine, sort of heartfelt um, uh, tweets sent in from people, sort of saying, you know, that was a really genuinely nice you know nice thing to happen and a really really nice thing to see um and and i i thought it was really touching i thought it was really really nice and uh, yeah i i think i think it just goes to show that football is or does have its really really good sides to it when things like that happen and i think it should be applauded and um as ross said you know it's the first home goal he'd got since his dad had passed um you know his, his support his teammates clearly you know clearly there for him as well um i i just think it was lovely so i tweeted it and um yeah people seem to like it so if you haven't seen the tweet or if you haven't seen the goal it's on our um at the fh podcast timeline uh courtesy of myself so um yeah give it a look if you like that kind of thing just to throw back to another goal on there and absolutely um agree with everything you've said that football is more than the 90 minutes and that's what we love about it um it was sam baldock after 11 minutes turning into neymar and uh, as much criticism as i've given him over this season he definitely made me eat my words when he smashed that in from about 30 yards or so <laughs> it's a cracker wasn't it i, I, I messaged you didn't i on whatsapp straight yeah. away and said oh because <laughs> just knew it was coming but yeah no it's a hell of a goal absolutely uh, quality goal um we are pushed for time a little bit, but um, I want to ask uh, James to talk just quickly on the championship. James, is it a, a league you you watch much of or have an opinion of or any teams you particularly enjoy watching? Sporadically. Um, not this week in particular, but that said, I um, have been really impressed by Brighton when I have watched them. I watched them against um, Birmingham just after they'd uh, sacked Gary Rower, and I was really impressed pressed by their persistence there, getting that late goal through Glenn Murray, who might join them, probably join them permanently because he's on loan at the moment. So I think Brian definitely an exciting team. Um, as are Sheffield Wednesday, to be honest. I think Sheffield Wednesday, they've bought really um, intelligently, perhaps players not exactly known to English football. Um, a few players from Carlos Carvajal's home country of Portugal. So I quite like to see them go up. But yeah, not too knowledgeable about the championship this season. Fair enough, fair enough. Like the honesty, um, Ross. Any fixtures you want to pick out ahead? Because obviously we've got a full fixture list coming up again in the next couple of days. It's it's all go at this time of the year. Um, do you any sort of games that leap out of you that, that you fancy us uh, having a look at? Uh, well, if you've listened to this podcast in time and it's uh, and it's still Thursday the 29th, Aston Villa versus Leeds. I'm not sure if that's on TV or not, but if it is, that is absolutely worth a watch because that is a pretty big fixture. Um, it is on TV. It is Sorry, on TV. Just to absolutely brilliant. That's uh, that's a fantastic game. Then if you can catch that, that will be uh, a fantastic watch. Um, 
Newcastle versus Nottingham Forest. I imagine that will have quite a few goals in it because Nottingham Forest cannot keep a clean sheet and Newcastle are going to want a, uh, a a swift recovery from their defeat. Reading Fulham is another tasty one as well, although that probably isn't going to be on TV. Um, and then Saturday, I'm looking around and, well, Norwich at the moment, they're a very interesting prospect. Um, there's not too many on, on Saturday, actually, that leap out at me as really, really lovely attacking football games. But uh, so, some big ones for managers in certain teams, like Barnsley, Birmingham. Um, Barnsley, obviously, free scoring at the moment in the championship. And uh, Birmingham City under pressure now because uh, because of Zola's slow start. So that'll be a big one. Um, and Wigan Athletic, poor old Wigan. They are, um, they are in a lot of trouble. And they have to go away to Derby County, which is the last thing you need, really. So there are some big fixtures. Um, the, the highlights for me, if they're on TV and you can catch them, Reading, Fulham, Newcastle, Forest and Aston Villa, Leeds. But uh, frankly, the whole division is always worth checking out because, like I always say, always a story in the championship. True that, true that. And uh, just quickly zipping through, we've got Premier League fixtures coming up as well. As we say, recording this on the 28th of December, we have got games coming up on Friday the 30th, where we see Hull Everton. Then on the Saturday, we've got the full normal programme, uh, Burnley, Sunderland, Chelsea, Stoke, Leicester, West Ham, Manchester United, Middlesbrough, Southampton, West Brom, Swansea, Bournemouth, uh, Liverpool, Man City. That's the big one of the evening, of course. And then we've got Watford Spurs, Arsenal Palace on New Year's Day. And then we've got all sorts of fixtures on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday after that. Uh, so we'll be uh, across those uh, stay tuned we will fit in another show at some point um, between now and the, now and the, or now and after the new year I would imagine so stay tuned for that one um, okay so let's uh, finish with a couple of questions shall we because I think we've had a we've had a couple come in so um, Josh I'm actually going to hand over to you because you put a couple here um, that have been sent to you personally so let's have those and then i think we've also got one from twitter so uh, i'll let you ask these uh, these two questions thank you very much uh i will go with the first one from a good friend of the show and myself stefan selby uh what makes three at the back work uh is something that we're seeing i would say becoming in vogue but it has been a formation that started in england and we only moved to the now traditional four at the back after watching Brazil do it in the uh, it was the 50, 54 World Cup, I think, off the top of my head. But I'll fire that one over to uh, Chris, I think. Interesting. What makes three at the back work? Yeah, I, uh, I'm i going to give a boring answer to this, actually. Um, I just think that when you change something, it works. Um, <laughs> it just works for a little while and then it takes you have to then work out why it takes people time to adjust to what you know to how to combat it it clearly works because it gives the midfield more more freedom more expanse um, in, in, in spaces to play um, it certainly suits attacking teams more um, if you're playing with attacking fullbacks it works perfectly for them as well so yeah I just think it's in vogue at the moment um, I'm personally still a more of a fan of a 4-2-3-1 myself um, with sort of three wide attack or three players uh, in behind a front man but it's horses for courses um, and I also subscribe to the idea that in the modern world uh, I personally think <clears throat> excuse me i personally think you should be able to change your system and the way you play um even in game personally i think a lot of modern formations are quite fluid so yeah that's that's my view on that um i would be interested just to get james's thoughts on that quickly if uh before we move on what do you make of the three at the back james because obviously your club has changed formation this season do you do you sort of buy into the changes that have been going on with the three at the back um the point you made at the end there, Chris, was was really good and something I definitely agree with and always say that formations are a lot more fluid than people realise. We have this obsession with when we see the um, screen at the beginning of a game thinking, all right, as if the players should stay in those positions exactly throughout the duration of the game, which isn't the case. Managers, coaches, um, what they think about, what we think about, I say, is that... Um, the formation with the ball is different to the formation without the ball. The formation in certain situations is different to other situations. And I think something that free at the back definitely offers, well, the way in which a lot of managers use free at the back is um, flexibility, fluidity. Um, and I think perhaps that's why, although it could be perceived as something that leaves you exposed, if done the right way, with lots of players roaming from positions, and if you have a centre-back in the mould of um, David Luiz or John Stones, a centre-back who likes to... Uh, play the ball out who likes to come and move in front of the defensive line then um, having three of the Mac means that another player can just drop back uh, and support 
cover for them. And I think um, that system, when you have so many in midfield, kind of enables that a bit more, makes it a bit easier. So you yeah, definitely agreed. have that change from defence to attack being a lot more fluid rather than players just being responsible, attacking players just being responsible for attacking, defensive players just being responsible for defending. It's that transition, isn't it, of, uh, mm. of moving from one system to another. Yeah, I agree. Uh, another question then, Josh, you can give this one to Ross if you like. Uh, yeah, I'll give this one to Ross, although I think maybe we split this across everyone because uh, it's quite a big ranging question, maybe a team from each person this one's from Akib. uh which teams need the most work in the january transfer window <laughs> wow <laughs> uh ross you can start i need some thinking time um which ones do they need or which ones do i think because that's that's two different qu- answers really um need i would probably say uh well i think it's i think it's clearly it's hull because they're still a championship team and the players they brought in were under 21s and championship level players so for me the, the team that does need the biggest overhaul is Hull they won't get it um, I think the one that will be the most active is either Palace or West Ham because West Ham are always active in a window and Palace have now got a new manager in charge so um, I think those two will be the busiest but I certainly think Hull if they can scroll up some money are the ones that need it the most Good answer James what do you reckon? Yeah pretty spot on there Hull probably won't have the money they need to spend I definitely think Allardyce will be looking to bring in um, some players to Palace and shake them up a bit. Again, Swansea need in, need investment. I'm not sure whether they'll get it. Um, I reckon Sunderland and West Ham will be quite active. Def- definitely West Ham. They're always looking to chop and change. And the likelihood that Zaza will leave and their kind of uh, need for a striker will definitely be a contributing factor. Although it's always amusing um, how... West Ham seem to expose their transfer plans every window um, through their owners or through uh, Jack Sullivan, um, uh, David Sullivan's son, because, I mean, announcing that you're going to spend however however much uh, on a striker probably isn't the best tactic going into a window, but each their own. Yeah, each their own indeed. Um, I, to answer the question personally... I, I'm torn between two. Swansea is the obvious one. I think there are huge, huge changes need to be to be made there um, in terms of playing personnel, uh, of course, as well as the manager, because that's going to be quite important depending on who they bring in will depend on who they can get. Um, the other one for me is slightly left field answer, Leicester. Um, I think they need real changes, um, if not for um, the, the, the sort of obviously Champions League. Yeah, they've been doing fine. I think they need huge changes just to freshen that squad up. Um, I think there's too many players are, are, are kind of just resting on their laurels. Too many are living off reputations. Um, and I think they need to bring in a couple. I think a few of the signings they made this summer haven't worked out. Um, and I would I certainly would, would think they need to strengthen that defence um, considerably, um, both at fullback and centre back. I think they need another option in in uh, attacking midfield. I think they'll be all right in holding midfield when they get uh, Nampalas Mendy back, who's a player I really, really like when he's fit. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they need another sort of attacking link midfielder um, and possibly even another forward because I like Slimani, but they're not really playing to his strengths. I think Uloa will, will end up leaving because he's not getting games. Um, Vardy's blowing very hot and cold. Um, maybe uh, I, I like Okazaki, but he doesn't play enough. So, yeah, I think I think Leicester might might be needing to do a bit of business um, in, in January as well. So, they're the two I would pick out personally. They're pretty much nailed on to um, sign Wilfred and D. D. Yes, the nineteen-year-old uh, Nigerian defensive bid. I think he's there's been talk that he's had a medical already. So I think it's just you know you need to cross the T's, dot the I's, and that that's sorted. And I heard they. Could be coming back in for Adrian Silva, who they had yeah. been projected for in the summer. He wanted to move, but I'm not sure they need two centre midfielders. I think you, you know, I think I agree with you in terms of where they need to strengthen, and it's in quite a few positions. I think they will get a few signings, perhaps two or three. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, I think, um, like you said, it just depends on, on the right person to bring in for the right reasons. But uh, it should also like, be said, if we're talking about transfers, that Everton are very close to Adam Ola Lutman from Charlton. Are they really? Which okay. is um, a bit yeah. of a shock to me, considering Kuman doesn't normally do youth development. I think he's kind of making a point of it now, because it was obviously a big talking point when Stamton beat him a few weeks back. But uh, Adam Ola-Lukman is apparently going to Everton for about £10 million. 
and another club that needs another club you could argue have need a bit of surgery as well because I think their squad oh, I, is I, another I, one I, I think the squad's actually right I think that's the way Koeman's managed it that's, that's the real issue but maybe I'm biased there but yeah I, I <laughs> think I think personally they did quite well in the window I think they bought a centre back that's probably the wrong age but other than that I think they did quite well a um, bit unlucky that's the fact Balassi got, got injured but I think they've actually got quite a good squad that's my issue uh, is the age of that squad I agree I just, yeah just think it's um i just think it's one of those squads that if they get a couple of serious injuries um and then they rely they, they've basically got no in between players um in that they've got very experienced older players and they've got you know the mason holgates of this world that are very young and raw that are not ready to be thrown in at this level and and i just think they could do with two maybe three players of a 26 27 year old kind of age where they can just come in and and fire because i i genuinely think that uh, Koeman is under pressure if Everton don't make Europe this year. I really do. I think that they're knowing Mashiri as I do from his Arsenal days. You know, he's he was looking for a club that could compete with Arsenal within three years. Um, if you don't even get to Europe in your first season, I'm not sure he'll want to stick with Koeman personally, but could be wrong. Yeah, that is true. I think that um, Everton, I think they did what West Ham did in the uh, summer transfer window. I think they got a bit ahead of themselves. So transfixed on making that marquee signing, or or several, they were looking at the likes of Julian Draxler, Yassine um, Brahimi. Um, when these weren't players that were necessarily within their reach, uh, so I think they perhaps missed out on making some more astute buys that would have been better suited to their team. But um, apart from that, I think their business was quite solid. I think um, the key thing was keeping hold of Lukaku. I don't think Stones is too much of a miss, but... You're right in saying that Ashley Williams is a good defender, but too old. I think he only has a season or so left in him. In Balassi, though, I think they got the wrong Palace winger. Yes. Wilfried Zaha would have been a better buy. Balassi, I don't... He's he, he's good in spurts, but I don't think he's been the player um, Everton hoped he'd be or a £30 million player. So Never I think... Never been consistent. Exactly. I wouldn't say their business was bad, but it was just uninspiring. Yeah, good I, I would come in and say that I think they made one of the signings of the summer in a hipster's choice of uh, Idris Gay from oh, absolutely. Villa. What yeah, a yeah. Good, good, good player he was for their midfielder. Yeah. And he's just allowed Gareth Barry to probably put another two years on his career yeah. with the all running. I, that all I would say about uh, Idris Gay, and I may sound like sour grapes here, but um, I think the only reason they went in for him is because A, they need someone in that position. But B, Southampton extensively scouted Adrissa Gay, and uh, we were closing in on him before we ended up going for Oriol Romeu. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm saying that Koeman uh, only really looked at him because of the scouting that Southampton did at the time. And they couldn't get Axel Witzel, who's off to Juventus. That yes, was another big, well. big say in, in why they couldn't get him. But yeah, agreed. And whoever does get Adrian Silva, by the way, is buying a very, very good centre forward. I think he will go from Porto in January for a lot of money. And um, he could do worse than going to Everton, although I think he might have his uh, sights set a little higher than that. But hell of a player. Um, last question then, uh, Josh. I think we've got time just for this last one. Yeah, I've just got one more from Twitter from uh, Noma, which is uh, how much longer does everyone think the Chelsea streak will go on? I've got an answer for this, but I'd like to hear everyone else's. Go on, give us yours first. I think the Tottenham game, which is two games down the line, I believe. It's not the game next, it's one after. I think they'll draw that one. Ooh, you've sort of taken my answer there, so I'll sit this one out because I agree with you. I think that might end up a draw. Um, do either Ross or James? Do you do you have uh, something different? Maybe thoughts on that? Uh, do you think if, if you're asking just about wins, then I agree that Tottenham will probably be the one that put the stop to the wins. In terms of unbeaten, I'm looking at the fixtures and I'm not seeing a loss until maybe the Liverpool Arsenal double that they have. Wow, is it uh, a White Hart Lane the Tottenham game? I think it is, isn't it? Uh, it is let me have a look yeah it yes, is, it is, is well, yeah. yes interesting yeah so that'll be and then the, yeah, the, the liverpool game is away and arsenal is at home but before that they've got some very bang average fixtures they've got peter in the cup leicester hull and then you've got uh chelsea play liverpool away and then home to arsenal wow yeah i think the big that, reason that... sorry i've let go on on that one yeah i think the big reason why that um spurs chelsea game could be a stumbling block is it is a midweek fixture um coming after weekend games. So the fact that they don't have long to recover, playing away to a team of Spurs strength, yeah, you would expect that to be 
um, somewhere they stumble. But I mean, for some reason, there's a I have a feeling about um, Leicester playing um, Chelsea at home. I have a feeling about that one. But it's just yeah. a gut feeling, nothing based on any rational thought. Stats or facts, it's see, just one of those. That, yeah. See, that one, that was the one I was going to mention. I think that is their first loss. Uh, the way to get at the uh, the way to get at a three at the back is with strong wing play. That's Unless true. you've got that strong wing play and a counter attack is how they'll win that game. Yeah. Uh, they go and bring in Okazaki and they've got Jamie Vardy. So that fluid, dogged front line that can get at those centre backs, that's the way they're going to beat Chelsea. Which is why I think Tottenham could do a job, but We've seen from previous uh, meetings of those two teams that a draw is probably the most likely outcome, probably mm. with a bit more fire in it. Uh, but the Leicester game, I think the way that Leicester play, that could be the game for them, where I oh. think they might lose. Of course, they need two two victories to equal Arsenal's uh, 14 wins in a row during the Invincible season, um, and uh, and obviously three to beat it. So, um, as you say, it, it's uh, Stoke City at home next. Um, no disrespect to Stoke, but if they play anything like they did at, at Anfield, or certainly in the second half, then you can't see too much stopping Chelsea winning that game. Um, and then they've got that test with Spurs uh, on the 4th, I think it is, um, of uh, of January. Uh, I presume the Leicester game is after that then, is it? I think it is. It's on the 14th after the FA Cup third round, which is ah. the week in between. 5.30 kickoff, yeah. It's at the King Power as well. So yeah, okay. Interesting. Okay, good uh, good question, Noma. And Noma has also asked a brilliant question, which we're not going to cover tonight because we need some thinking time, but I'm going to put it in our little WhatsApp group for our hipsters to work, work out before we do uh, potentially a live show, which I'll touch on in a second as we close off the show. But she's asked us uh, a brilliant question, which is, um, uh, can the hipsters give us each uh, a 12 uh, in other words, 11 plus a manager for 2016. Um, and uh, she wants that done for all the leagues. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll give we'll give Ross the inevitable task of doing the Premier League and Championship versions. Or maybe actually what we could do is give Josh one and Ross the other. Um, and then I'll try and dig out uh, Drew's, John's and my choices for the other leagues. Um, and the Spanish one, we'll just have to try and club all together it between us. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. But It'll just be we'll, Real Madrid and Barca, so... It probably will, to be honest. Yeah, it probably will. Although there has been a few teams I've watched that have impressed me with some some talent. So uh, maybe we can dig some of that. But that's a great question. And we'll, we will give that the time it deserves in a, a future podcast. Um, we've got a bit longer tonight, but um, hey, who cares? It's our podcast. We can do what we like. Um, obviously, we haven't had a lot of contact, content. Sorry. And uh, due to the fact our European leagues are now on their winter breaks, although they're all in bloody Dubai, I think. But uh, because of our, our leagues being on their winter hiatus, um, we thought we'd make these English breakfast shows that little bit longer which is obviously why we've got James on tonight and hopefully we'll have a, give you enough content to get you through until the new year before the uh, regular podcast uh, sort of kicks back in again we will do another show um, between now and probably just after the new year and then we are looking into doing a live show for those of you who haven't seen our tweet uh, which I think is actually still pinned to our uh, our Twitter page I'll have to check that but we put a little poll out uh, just asking you, the listeners, whether you would be interested in us doing a live show, sort of a Google Hangouts on live on YouTube style show. Um, and so far, I've had 58 votes, which is great. Thank you all. Um, and uh, so far, we've got 60 percent of you are saying, yes, it's a great idea. Um, and what have we got else? 17 uh, percent said, no, just keep it as it is. And 23 percent said, yes, but I don't think I can listen live. So don't worry if you can't listen live. Don't worry. It will be released as a normal podcast. You just won't be able to interact with the the chat box. If you're unfamiliar with how these Google Hangouts work, basically we go live on YouTube. Um, you can see our smiley faces um, if we're on camera. Some of us won't be, but most of us will be. And um, we're literally just going to sit there for an hour, two hours maybe, um, and just wait till the questions dry up. And just get your guys and girls' thoughts, um, any leagues within reason that we know a little bit about, hopefully. Um, we'll try and answer some of your questions, maybe just get into a little bit of a discussion, a bit of a round table, and just generally fire some opinions back and forth. So if that's something that you think you'd enjoy, um, let us know via the poll you can still vote in it there's three days left to vote so if you haven't voted get along and uh, cast your vote but it seems pretty unanimous at the moment that people want us to do that so 
we'll uh, we'll try and get a date in the diary and that will be coming soon but as i say we'll be back with another english breakfast after the uh, the new year's action uh, had a date to be decided keep your thoughts coming in uh, at the fh podcast we're available on youtube soundcloud and itunes as well uh, we're also on stitcher and a few other podcatchers if you want to find us on there uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, we appreciate any reviews or uh, ratings that you leave for us so thank you very much right uh, we'll draw a line there we're not going to do the tables tonight because there's so many games coming in such a short space of time um, we frankly just can't keep up with it all so there you go uh, right, my thanks then to my panel this evening, uh, Ross and Josh, as usual. Thank you for coming on. Pleasure as ever. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, a very successful debut from James. Thank you very much for joining us, James. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope to be back again. Yes, we will. Uh, we will look to extend your uh, your loan period um, <laughs> if we can get permission from uh, from your athletics body because we don't want to take up their time. Uh, but no, we will, we'll have you back, no worries. But thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I should say, if you want to follow us individually, you can see all of our uh, individual Twitter handles on the on the page, on the Football Hipsters um, Twitter page. If you want to follow James, you can also do that. Uh, James, what's your Twitter handle that people can grab you at? Oh, no, it's Truscott. Rather Super. embarrassing handle, but I have to go with that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so, yeah, if you want to follow James, you can do that as well right okay well thank you very very much for joining us we really appreciate the support and the love shown for the podcast throughout 2016 our debut year of course and as i say we will see you or speak to you in 2017 Uh, enjoy your football there's plenty more to come and we'll be back in your ears very soon